Hi everyone, we're in the third and last of our series, unpacking our distinctives as a church. We saw in our first week that we're all about Jesus. We want to make much of him. We want to serve him because he is our king. He's our savior who has loved and who has served us. Secondly, we're about people. Jesus has wonderfully saved us into a family. And so this group of people at Christchurch Cascades, God has gathered together. He's united us to one another so that we can give ourselves to care for, to encourage, and to push each other towards love and good deeds. And today, our last distinctive, we're all about eternity. So let's pray as God reminds us who he has made us into. Bow with me. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these wonderful truths, these distinctives of who we are. Thank you that you have given us wonderful identity and you've given us purpose. And so today as we think about eternity, things eternal, these are hard things to wrap our minds around and yet give us understanding, deep understanding into what eternity means for us and what it means for us in the here and now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Living forever is something that has captured the imagination of people since time began. Because if there's one thing that we know for sure, and that will affect 100% of all people, is that we're born and that we'll die. And so, what lies past death? And is there any way for us to push death back or even defeat it? Our people have done some, some pretty crazy things to try and achieve immortality from a third century Chinese emperor drinking mercury, which didn't work, to people ingesting the neurotoxin of pufferfish, which was thought to achieve some kind of resurrection. It doesn't. To cryogenic freezing, to the latest research looking to make us robotic and to implant our, our consciousness into machines. The quest continues, and it always seems to be just beyond our grasp. And so death is an enemy that frightens many people. There's a line in the song by a band called Mumford and Sons, and it goes, death is just so full and man so small. Well, I'm scared of what's behind and what's before. The future is so uncertain, but for Christians, it is full of hope. Three weeks ago, we started the year in Philippians chapter three, where God reminded us that this life is like running a marathon and we are running towards a prize at the end a certain prize a sure future where there's eternal life where pain and sickness and sin and cyclones and everything that is wrong with this world will be sorted out where death will be defeated and for christians is nothing more than sleep only to wake up with eternal life with new physical perfect and glorious bodies which aren't robotic but best news of all we will be with god we'll be face to face with him and we'll be together as a family not over zoom or youtube and so the future for us is bright it is fixed it is set and how is it that we can be so sure when everything else in this world seems so uncertain and the answer is because of jesus for god so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life, John 3, 16. To get eternal life, we, we don't need cryogenics or making some kind of secret potion. It's trusting in the one who offers life. And we can be certain because Jesus came into this world, he died and he defeated death, he was raised. People saw him, myriads of witnesses and evidence attests to this. And so because Jesus has gone through death and come out the other side, we can believe in him. We can have absolute certainty that what he offers is real and is trustworthy. He will follow through and will give us eternal life with him if we believe. Now, if you're not convinced or you'd like to explore this evidence further, Uh, We run a course called Discover Jesus, where we examine the evidence of Jesus' life, his his death, his resurrection. Please do email me, richard at christchurchcascades.co.za for more details on that. We're going to be kicking off a Discover Jesus course in a few weeks' time. We'd love for you to join us and to explore some more. But our future as Christians 
is secure. Eternal life is ours. And so the question for us this afternoon is, what does that mean for us in the here and now? If eternal life is ours, if it is sure, how should we shape our lives in the present? Cue our passage this afternoon. Jesus tells this parable to his disciples. It's, it's a made-up story which teaches a real-life truth. And this is going to help us how to live now in the light of eternity. Now, this parable is a little tricky and one which has caused people to panic a little because of the character who Jesus uses in this story as an example for us to follow. But let's unpack it together and my prayer is it becomes clearer as the Holy Spirit gives us insight. So let's jump into it. You would have noticed there that the parable has two main characters. There's this wealthy business owner and there's a reckless manager. The manager is there to watch over the business while the owner is maybe away or possibly tending to other business opportunities. But the owner receives an accusation that his manager is involved in all kinds of wasteful expenditure. So he calls for an audit and the manager quickly realizes that a whole lot of dirt is going to be dug up and there's no ways he's going to be getting a severance package. He's getting the ax. And so he starts to worry. Verse 3, Jesus tells us this manager's internal dialogue. He's talking to himself as, he's tr- as he tries to figure out what to do. And he has a couple of options. He can be demoted and move from a position of management to become a laborer. But he knows that because he's had an office job for a while, he's got soft hands and he's not strong enough to dig. His second option is he could beg. Perhaps somebody would offer him a loan, maybe. But who? Especially if he is going to be found guilty and kicked out of his position for squandering his owner's possessions. So he's too ashamed to beg and rely on people's kindness. And so he has to hatch a plan. And isn't it amazing what humans can creatively scheme when our backs are against the wall? This manager innovates. And the language here is the same as the previous parable in chapter 15, the parable of the the prodigal son. Many of you will know the story. There's a son who asks his father for his inheritance early, and he goes out and he squanders all of it. And there he is living in poverty, eating food that, that is fed to pigs. But then, as he was sitting there with his food in front of him, he comes to his senses, and he decides to return to his father, who would hopefully accept him back as one of his workers. Well, here, the prodigal manager, if you like, has an aha moment. He he comes to his senses. While this audit is taking place, he hasn't been removed from his position as manager. He can still make decisions in this business. And so what he does is he opens up the company books and he uses his power to renegotiate debt. So someone owes his owner 100 measures of olive oil. That's 3,200 liters roughly, okay? So this isn't just a couple of bottles that we have lying around in in our kitchen cupboards. The manager says to this debtor, you know what, settle up now, and I, out of the the goodness of my heart, I'll cut your bill in half, 50% off for you. Someone else owns uh, owes the owner 100 measures of wheat. That's somewhere in the region of 40,000 liters, okay? Some, some suggest that that's wheat from around 100, 100 hectares worth of wheat fields. The manager has a look at this, and he, he says to the debtor, he says, you know what, settle up now, and I'll take 20% off for you. What is the manager doing? Well, he is using his authority given to him to make some friends, to buy himself some favors, so that when he's out of work, he'll have people who will look on him favorably. In the Hebrew culture, I guess much like many cultures around the world, there was a very strong sense of, if I help you, you help me when the time comes. I scratch your back, you scratch mine. Now, we we look at the story and we say, sure, that's very sneaky, it's very clever, But it is quite underhanded, and yet verse 8 is the shock. Look at what the owner says when he finds out what has happened. Verse 8. The master praised 
the unrighteous manager because he had acted shrewdly. The manager has assessed the future and used the resources at his disposal to make friends for himself. Now, he's not praised for his stealing and his unrighteousness, his, his wasteful expenditure. Okay, he's being fired for that. And I want to be clear. Jesus is in no way sanctioning dishonesty of any kind. But he is highlighting an important principle for us. Shrewdness. Have a look at halfway through verse 8 with me. Jesus says, For the children of this age, as non-Christians, are more shrewd than the children of light, as Christians, in dealing with their own people. In other words, this manager has put more energy into thinking about the future and letting that shape his present than Christians do. This parable is here to show us our eternal blind spot. If Jesus has come to offer eternal life, that should change how we live now. And Jesus says here, we need to be shrewd. Now, what does that look like? Well, verse 9 gives us the answer. Jesus says, I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of worldly wealth, so that when it fails, they might welcome you into eternal dwellings. Jesus is telling us here that we are to use the resources that he has entrusted to us to make friends for the future. We have the opportunity to use our stuff our worldly wealth, that is our possessions, our belongings, our assets, everything that is at our disposal. These are things that Jesus says here that, that will fail, right? They, they fall apart, they break down, and they can't last. But we can use these temporary things to have an eternal impact on others. Jesus came to offer eternal life. And folks, it's our wonderful responsibility and our joy and our privilege to help connect people to this life giver. And again, we, we saw this a couple of weeks ago in Philippians chapter 3. Who will be Paul's joy and crown into eternity? We saw it wasn't his stuff. It was the Philippians. He used everything that he had to love them and to teach them about Jesus. And he would then be welcomed into eternity by these friends who came to find life in Christ through Paul shrewdly using the temporary resources available to him. And so Jesus is really challenging us here to invest ourselves and our things into eternity. I remember uh, the pastor who led the church I went to when I was a, a kid growing up preaching on this passage, and he used an illustration that is kind of forever stuck in my mind to help understand this point. He said, go to the shops and buy two different kinds of stickers, blue stickers uh, and red stickers. And he said, take the blue stickers and put those stickers on all the things that you can't take with you into eternity. What are the things that aren't eternal? And that's stuff, right? So he started by pulling out his wallet and he stuck a blue sticker onto his wallet. He stuck one onto his car, onto his house, his computer, his phone, and even things that he had for his hobbies. Then he said, take those red stickers and put those on things uh, that you can take with you. And what are those? Well, it's only people. Then he explained that what Jesus is teaching us here is that we must use the blue stickers, the blue things, to help get the red things to heaven. That is why we've been given the blue things. We have the chance to use our limited time and our limited possessions for eternal purposes. And folks, just imagine that day as we enter eternity and there are the people who have eternal life through us using our stuff to help them hear about Jesus. They will be our joy and crown forever. That is the best return on investment we could ever ask for. Don't forget eternity. And we do it so quickly. We drop our eyes, we, we lose our urgency. Why do we do that? Well, it's because our, our things, or our pursuit of things, blind us to what is really important and what is eternal. Now, there's nothing wrong with having stuff and earning money, but when they stop being tools to use, they become cruel masters because they'll never last, they'll never satisfy, and will always want more. So Jesus ends the section with, 
with very sobering words. Verse 13, he says, he says, No servant can serve two masters, since he'll either hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Just like you can't walk in two different directions at once, you cannot serve both God and your stuff. They both demand absolute devotion, and there's only space for one or the other. Church, everything that we have been given has been given by God. It belongs to Him. We are stewards of His stuff. And so think eternity. You know, you've all seen those stickers on, on cars, think bike. Jesus is telling us here, think eternity. Every day, we are one step closer to eternal life. And what we do now can have eternal impact on others. Don't let your stuff that will fall and fail get in the way of that. Go today. Go sit down and get shrewd. What has God given you? And how can you use it to help others see Jesus? Now, I'm an expert at being shrewd in finding ways to getting the things I want. You know, I'll manipulate the budget and get it to do backflips, to get it to do the impossible. Why am I often not like that when it comes to giving to eternity? Well, it's because things so quickly become more than things to me. You might say this often you don't have much, and so this doesn't really apply. Well, faithfulness is what Jesus is really after here in this passage. And, and it's not about volume or amount. Have a look at verse 10 with me. Jesus says, Whoever is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. And whoever is unrighteous in very little is also unrighteous in much. So if you have not been faithful with worldly wealth, who will trust you with what is genuine? And if, if you have not been faithful with what belongs to someone else, who will give you what is your own? So kids listening in and teens and students, just because you might not have much yet doesn't mean you can't be faithful with what you do have. What, is, what has been given to you by God and how can you use it to help people hear about Jesus? And it's an important discipline to start getting used to because Jesus says if you're faithful with little, you will also be faithful with much. So how can you use your toys or your books or your phone this week? Adults, how can you use your cars? How can you use your time, your, your education, your jobs, your assets, your money, your hobbies? Go sit down and be shrewd and make a plan in the present, in your current context, which look, will be different in a year's time and is probably very different to what it was a year ago. But currently, with what you have, with what God has given you, how will you make friends for Christ? Invest in eternity. I've got a friend who, while was young and newly married, wanted to be faithful with the little that he and his wife had. And so they started what became known as the Egg on Toast Club. As students, you're always somehow able to scrape together some cash for food. So he got together a group who, instead of going out, met up together and ate Egg on Toast and pooled the money that they, had, they would have spent on a meal out and donated it to different Christian ministries. Shrewdness for Jesus. And look, we might go, gee, you know, that seems so small and, and so seemingly insignificant. You know, the amount of money that's required to take the gospel out to the ends of the earth, we just need so much. You know, how does my little contribution help? Well, you never know. You never know what our big God can do with our little acts of faithful generosity as we think eternity. I want to end with the story of a man who was faithful with the little that he had. One night in a church in Bournemouth, England, the senior pastor of this church, Dr. Francis Dixon, asked his youth pastor, Peter, to share his testimony. Peter got up and he said, while I was in the Navy, I was walking down George Street in Sydney, Australia, and out of nowhere, this stranger stepped out, handed me a pamphlet, and then he said to me, excuse me, sir, if you were to die today, where would you spend eternity? Then the man left. Peter had never been confronted with a question like that before and he couldn't get it out of his mind. And so when he got back to England, he met up with somebody who took him to church and praise the Lord, he became a Christian. A while later, both this pastor Dixon and his youth pastor had a, a big youth event at, at the same church. And one of their visiting speakers, his name was Noel, shared his testimony. And he said, you know, while I was in the Navy 
and my ship was stationed in Sydney, I was walking down George Street when this man, this strange man, offered me a religious pamphlet and said, young man, I have a question to ask you. If you should die tonight, where would you go? Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? And he said, it bothered, it bothered me for so many months. I, I sought out a Christian. He helped me understand this and, and I gave my life to Christ. So we are, there the pastors were asking, coincidence? Well, the following year, Pastor Dixon was invited to preach across Australia. And while in Adelaide, he decided to tell the story of, of Peter and Noel's separate encounters with this man on George Street. And as he was speaking, another man in the church stood up by the name of Corporal Murray Wilkes. And he jumped up excitedly and he said, I'm another, I'm another. I was drawn to receive Christ by, in the same way by this same man on George Street. And so when, when Pastor Dixon now arrived in Sydney to preach, he was eager. He wanted to find, more, find out more about this urban missionary. And he was able to trap, track him down in a humble little house. There was this man called Frank Jenner. As Pastor Dixon told him of these young servicemen who had come to know Christ through his simple question, Frank Jenner began to weep. He had very little money. He wasn't impressive in any kind of way. And, and one of the reasons he, he didn't really have much money is because he couldn't hold down a job because what he kept doing was he, he tried to keep evangelizing all of his colleagues and annoyed them so much he, he kept getting fired. But he had faithfully asked this simple question for 16 years of everybody who walked past his place. And this was the first time he had ever heard of anyone coming to Christ through it. Over the next few years, Pastor Dixon uh, preached around the world and often spoke of Frank Jenner. Pastors and missionaries in the UK, in India, the USA, and Jamaica had all been converted through this one question by this faithful servant who knew eternity was on the way. Frank Jenner died a, a poor man in 1977. He spent the latter part of his life working as a janitor for the tech company IBM. While he was alive, very few people knew him. He wasn't a famous missionary on the cover of Joy magazine, but it is estimated that over the course of his life, he printed pamphlets and he spoke to between 100 and 150,000 people. And while he didn't have much in this life, can you imagine the hero's welcome he received entering heaven well done good and faithful servant you were faithful over a few things i will put you in charge of many things share your master's joy folks eternity is a day closer we have the message of life in christ god has given us gifts and resources as a church this year get shrewd what can you do with the things God has given you. And maybe we need to ask the question, what can we do without so that we can get this life-giving message out into our community and beyond? Big or small, let's faithfully think eternity. Bow with me, let's pray together. Father God, thank you for this powerful word that sits before us, this parable, which reminds us that we need to be shrewd Father, we have a life-giving message. And so will you help us to use the many resources that you have given us so that we can make friends. We can take this life-giving message of Jesus out to as many as we can. And Father, what a great hope that we have as Christians to know that our joy and crown will be waiting. There will be people who will stand before your throne forgiven through our little efforts, our little acts of generosity as we help people come to know Christ's great sacrifice for them. And so help us to leave the service and to go and do business with you and with our things, to take up this challenge to be shrewd and to do big things this year and in through our family. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.